had some relationship with Krishna because these symptoms developed when he heard that Krishna had already killed Kangsa. Srila Rupa Goswami remarks that there is also transcendental excellence in this kind of symptom. Why is that? Any idea? Hmm? Pick up the microphone. It's in relation to Krishna. Yeah, even if someone is in a state of fear that Krishna is going to, oh, Krishna killed Kansa, now he's going to come kill me. See? Then still he's going to be thinking of Krishna night and day, constantly, even though the motivation or the mood is fear. So uh, this is, of course, not a very, not a very pure or uh, advanced relationship with Krishna, but it's still relationship with Krishna. So there is some transcendental value in it, and we generally see that the demons that are killed by Krishna, then they go, they get liberated, and they go to the uh, Brahman. Okay, disease that? Oh, child. When Krishna was absent from Vrindavan and was staying at Matra, some of his friends informed him, Dear Krishna, because of their separation from you, the inhabitants of Braja are so afflicted that they appear to be diseased. Their bodies are feverish and they cannot move properly. They are simply lying down on the ground and breathing heavily. In the 10th canto, 12th chapter, verse 44 of Srimad Bhagavatam, Maharaj Parikshit asked about Lord Ananta. And upon hearing this question, Shukadev Goswami began to show symptoms of collapsing. Yet he checked himself and answered King Parikshit's question in a mild voice. This collapsing condition is described as a feverish state resulting from ecstatic pleasure. Shukadeva Goswami was extremely ecstatic. Some people say, well, um, the Srimad Bhagavatam doesn't actually mention Radharani by name. You know, and they, they criticize that. Well, if Srimati Radharani was actually there in Vrindavan, then the Srimad Bhagavatam should mention her, but it doesn't. So she's just mentioned indirectly like one gopi. Uh, for example, in the description of the Rasa dance, when uh, Krishna was dancing with all the gopis and then suddenly disappeared, the gopis talk among themselves and they say, Krishna has left the Rasa dance with one gopi, but they don't mention the name, or Shukadev doesn't mention. And the reason for this was that if Shukadev mentioned the name of Srimati Radharani, he would go into an ecstatic trance that could last for days. And they were under time pressure because Maharaj Parikshit was cursed to die in seven days. So he had to finish giving all these instructions in seven days. He didn't have time to like go into an ecstatic trance, you know, and uh, then they would have to revive him and it would take so long. And, and like that. So he avoided mentioning so many things. But at times when, when Maharaj Parikshit would ask a question that touched on some of his ecstatic emotions, he would like, you know, oh, Lord Ananta. <laughs> you know, this was his, his ecstatic nature. Oh, yeah. There is another statement in Srimad Bhagavatam telling of the damsels of Raja meeting Krishna at the sacred place of Kurukshetra many years after their childhood pastimes. When they met in that sacred place, all the gopis became stunned by the occurrence of a solar eclipse. Their breathing, blinking of the eyes, and all similar activities stopped, and they stood before Krishna just like statues. This is another instance of a diseased condition resulting from exuberant transcendental pleasure. Oh, this is such a heavy story. Whew. You know, Krishna lived 
in Vrindavan for the first 16 years of his appearance. And then he left and he had all these adventures in Matra and Dvarka for a long time, actually for 108 years. So the residents of Vrindavan were separated from Krishna for 108 years. And then after the battle of Kurukshetra, uh, a great sacrifice was held on the battlefield itself. Well, actually, before, the, the, before Kurukshetra was a battlefield, it was a sacrificial arena. The name Kuru Kshetra means that it was the sacrificial uh, arena of the Kuru kings, the Kuru dynasty. So the, uh, the residents of Vrindavan, because they were members of the Kuru dynasty, they went also along with all the Kuru kings and, and many of their subjects and, and so on uh, to Kuru Kshetra on the occasion of this solar eclipse. So what happened was that um, while the sacrifice was, you know, uh, being performed, because during the solar eclipse, the, uh, the priests and their, uh, all the people would bathe in a sacred place while chanting mantras during the solar eclipse. Because the, the Vedic explanation of what a, a solar eclipse is, is that when that the, the sun gets eaten by Rahu, See, Rahu is the south node, no, is it south? No, the north node of the moon. When the moon crosses the celestial equator in the direction from south to north, uh, that's Rahu. And when the orbit of the moon crosses the celestial equator from north to south, that's Ketu. These are also called the ascending nodes, uh, node and the descending node. So these two planets, Rahu and Ketu, are shadow planets. One is the shadow of the moon that causes a solar eclipse, and the other one is the shadow of the earth that causes a lunar eclipse. With me so far? OK. So at that time, then all of the members of the, of the Yadu dynasty and the remaining Kurus they all went to Kurukshetra, and of course, Krishna also went. So the residents of Vrindavan got to meet Krishna after 108 years of separation. And uh, so there was this incredibly ecstatic scene where Krishna met Radharani and the gopis again after, and his mother and father and all the residents of Vrindavan but especially the gopis, after 108 years. And of course, Krishna came just at the moment of the solar eclipse. I mean, who can imagine this? I mean, it was like so ecstatic, so incredibly heavy and intense. And uh, this is when Radharani spoke the famous verse about black moonlight, all this. I mean, you just have to read it. <laughs> if I try to describe it, I might go into an ecstatic trance. So <laughs> we have to finish the broadcast. You know? It would be kind of dull to just, you know, watch me just sitting here, you know, going out of my mind. <laughs> but anyway, the devotees should understand all these things because this is Krishna. This is Krishna's character. He likes to create these intense, dramatic scenes that uh, build up over a long period of time. And then suddenly there's this incredibly dramatic resolution. You know? And at this time, the most intense emotions are generated in his devotees. And he enjoys this. This is Krishna's play with his devotees because he, his actions serve to increase the intensity of their love for him. This is Krishna's business. He likes to increase the intensity of his devotee's love. And so he does all these dramas. Prabhupada was also very expert at this. 
Prabhupada would uh, do these pastimes. Like he would say, I'm coming to this temple. And everybody would go crazy, like painting, cleaning, decorating, making everything first class for Srila Prabhupada. And then at the last minute, he would delay his trip uh, or he would go someplace else. And then the president would have to go to that place and say, but Prabhupada, you promised to come and visit us and we're all ready and everything like that. And then Prabhupada would say, okay, I'm coming. And so then they would go back and they would get everything ready again. And then Prabhupada would delay again. You know, and, oh, they would just go crazy. <laughs> so, you know, this Prabhupada knew exactly what he was doing. It wasn't, it wasn't that he was absent-minded or something like this. No, he was, he was playing with his devotees to increase their love. Uh, um, you know, some of these traits of Krishna kind of rub off on his devotees.